Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. So take the A train starts, which is, you know, I know, okay, Rod's gonna come out next and do his warm up. And Rod finishes his warm up and they do the opening slate and he's telling us, you know, 15 seconds, lick your lips and sit up straight and blah, 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 and get ready to applaud. And we start applauding and music comes on, lights are on, they're doing the opening pan. And I hear my name. My name is Ted Slauson, and uh, I was born in, on uh, an Air Force base in Massachusetts. My dad was in the Air Force. From uh, there, when I was six weeks old, we moved to Wisconsin, which is where both of my parents are from. Lived there for a few years, moved down to the Kansas City, Missouri area, where my dad was stationed for a few years. And then in 1970, they moved to California, where my dad was transferred. Uh, he retired in 1972, so they ended up just staying in California, but that's they're still living in the house that I grew up in, the house that I remember most from my childhood. The Price is Right, America's love-in with the giveaway. A hit in prime time in the 1950s, by 1972, the producers decide time is right for a daytime version. Roger Dobkowitz started as a production assistant on The Price is Right. It was his first job in television. For the showcase, the reveal of the showcase, we actually take calculators to the readout machine with gaffer's tape on that machine and that machine. And I had to enter in the, in the mouth and open oh, Now the difference, difference is that then I had to jump over here and the, and the operators had to enter in all that information. I mean, you look back, how do we ever put together a game show using this rudimentary equipment? Nowadays, everyone has four TVs and a million channels to watch. Well, back in the early 70s, there were four channels and we had one TV. And with six kids, obviously, we had to all agree on what to watch. And, you know, my older brothers and sisters decided they wanted to watch The Price is Right. So I grudgingly, you know, sat down and watched it with them. And by the end of the show, I was pretty much hooked. And I still have just about all of my name tags and contestant cards from all the tapings I've been to. I went to, I'm pretty sure it was 37 altogether. What's interesting is that in the old days on the left, they had more kind of a pastel color. And then as they got into the 2000s, they got kind of bright in their colors. 
I have been a mathematics teacher and in mathematics assessment. We mostly uh, write and develop and review test questions that go on the assessments that students take. I didn't have anything to do on the show at the beginning. As I tell a lot of young people, I said, that's a wonderful position to be in. But what happened is that people started asking me to help them. I helped them with the prizes, I helped them with the scripts, I helped them copying, I helped them this, I helped them that. And I began to pick up a little bit of everything. My mathematical ability really kind of surfaced around junior high level. So that, of course, with the numbers and everything and all the prices, that kind of made a connection for me. Hi, this is Ted. And this is Linda. And we're here for the homework helpline. So have your program, your problems ready, and we'll be waiting for your call. So one week, I got into, like, watching Prices Rights from, like, 1973. Side-by-side refrigerator freezer from world-famous Amana. The same refrigerator freezer is on four different episodes that I watched, and it was $789 all four times. I'm like, well, see, there it is. There's proof. It was way back in the beginning. It was the same, you know, same stuff over and over. And it's that hideous avocado green. My brother and I, I think, both noticed, oh, well, I remember the price of this was 1500 or whatever. It would be 1500 again, and so that kind of inspired me to start kind of tracking prices or, you know, keeping records, if you will. When I would record the shows and put it all in a Word doc and everything and put it in the database, pretty much every show I had to add four or five new things because they were always bringing new stuff on. I went to San Francisco State University, and when you go after a master's degree, you got to write a thesis. In those days, you had to put it all on paper. And I wrote a thesis about this thick, 200 pages. I wrote a thesis on game shows because I love game shows. I would actually sit and watch game shows in the afternoon, wait for the credits to roll, saw who produced them, and they only showed the credits once a week, so if you missed it once a week, you have to wait a whole another week. And I sent a copy of my thesis out to like 20 or 30 game show producers. I saw Mark Goodson, and Mark Goodson was one of those people. He's larger than life. A big office, big desk. Speaking for the price is right, a Mark Goodson television production. Near the end of the interview, he said to me, he said, when are you flying back to Los Angeles? I said, flying back? I'm driving back. And his eyes got really big. He said, you drove to New York? I said, yes, I drove to New York. I, I drove, I have a VW bug, and I drove to New York. And in the hotel, I remember to this day, there was a little slip of paper in the, in the somebody phoned for you, Roger, here it is. It was Mark Goodson's office. Please phone the office. I phoned the office right away, and the secretary said, Mark Goodson would like to see you tomorrow. Oh, whoa. And I went into his office, and he said, Roger, I decided to hire you because... Anyone that would drive to New York City for an interview has a lot of initiative. And this is The Price is Right that I wrote back in the early 1990s. And it has all the games that were on the show that year. You type in some names of some players, and you can type up to nine. Last thing is a random number so that the prizes and prices and everything get randomized. There we go. So we have the opening of the show, it's all in text with, you know, fake lights going around and it's calling down at least two of the people that I put in. And as the standard opening, of course, you know, when the doors open, it's not going to be Bob Barker because I wasn't that good of a programmer back then. When I was on duty, I had a disc jockey show. We had a studio there. There was an audience participation show. The host didn't show up. He was never ashamed to take a drink. And I think that he probably over imbibed. But in any event, G. Pearson Ward came rushing in there. Bob, you have to, everything was live. There were no taping networks. She rushed in there. He said, you have to get out there and do that show. And so out I went. I didn't have time to get nervous. I grabbed the pan mic, went out started talking to the audience, 
And I got about three or four laughs. And I thought, I like this. <laughs> I'm going to try to make them do that some more. And fortunately, my wife, Dorothy Jo, heard that show. And when I got home, she said, Parker, that's what you should do. She said, you did that better than you've ever done anything else. <laughs> I mean, Bob Parker has said every game on the show had an element of luck. A good chunk of those games, if you had a really good knowledge of prices, you were going to win. $500, not bad, not real money, so I'm going to go ahead and look at the next hole. Next hole is worth... Oh, there it is, $10,000. It's just that easy. And I think I will keep that. And so after, after 12 years, uh, Goods liked me, and when there was an opening, he promoted me to be a producer because he realized not only did I know the show, I loved the prices, right? I just loved the prices, mm -hmm. right? And at the start of that, I, I really became much closer to Bob Barker. Well, uh, any pride that I feel, I have to share with several people. One of them right over here, Roger Dobkowitz. He was a splendid producer, and he protected me in every situation where a little protection was needed. And he, he's a dear friend, too. I had a very close friend who lived right across the street. Her name was Dee. She and my brother and I would play The Price is Right, where one of us would plan the whole show. The other one wouldn't have to be all the contestants, however it worked. We had planned a trip, kind of because it was the first time we both could go and do our own thing as adults. And I told her, absolutely, for certain, one thing we are doing is going to The Price is Right. In real life, every game has a time limit. If you play checkers, there's no official time limit. Hurry up, hurry up, make your move. I don't have all day. And this is what Bob used to do. Well, I was kind of surprised the show was still on the air because they had taken so many game shows off to expand the soap operas to an hour. Hurry up, We've got Young and the Rest of Us is coming. Make your decision, what do you want, what do you want? It would become very exciting. I was really worried that Price is Right would never make it until my 18th birthday, and here I am 52 years old and the show's still going strong. Um, from Sacramento, we drove to Los Angeles, and instead of being intelligent and taking the shortest, most direct route, we decided we would kind of meander over toward the coastal area and take US 101, which is a much longer drive. Um, of course, what Dee didn't realize when we made that decision is it gave her much more time to quiz me on my price list for the show. If you ask her today, 33 years later, She'll still complain about how much time she had to spend quizzing me on those prices. If you're a New Yorker, you might often get the feeling that you're waiting on a perpetual line. But here in L.A., this is no ordinary day and no ordinary line. These 300 people are waiting to take part in a TV audience phenomenon. Well, you show up and you hope that there's not more than 300 people there already. Of course, even if there aren't that many people, you have to hope there's not a bunch of groups who are going to come that, to the show that day. But you do spend a lot of time waiting, waiting on benches, waiting outside the gates until they open them in the morning. While they wait, a small army is preparing a stage show that couldn't be topped in Vegas. The CBS pages come through the line. They will create your name tag, and if you have a long name like mine, they might have to make one or two or three of them before they get it all on there. I just want to know what, what you're feeling right now. It's my tie. I feel it right here. <laughs> 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 well, you tell Roger Dobkus will tell you we're going to go out there as if it were uh, opening day. That's right. We're going out there as if it were opening day. Or is it opening night? Opening <laughs> day. It's opening a daytime day. show. Sorry, that's for daytime. Is yes. Right. Caress leave just skin softer than soap. Skin feels better when it's caressed. Well, I had always liked Holly, who was one of the models on the show um, ever since I was a kid. She just seemed like the most genuine, the most kind of goofball. Um, and so my sister had this idea. We had a shirt made that said, I'm here to kiss Holly. And the guy who made it was very helpful. And he was like, how about we put some felt hearts behind Holly's name? And he got, you know, the most fancy cursive for her name. And, you know, a lot of times people would get picked who had special shirts made. Then we decided on the back, we would put, sorry, Bob. And he insisted on making a little frowny face out of little scraps of felt. And so, um, 
That was the shirt I wore to the first taping. The job of picking contestants goes to co-producer Philip Wayne. He's not above dropping an honest word to a hopeful prospect. I was stuttering through my interview. And he, you know, seemed unimpressed with me and kind of brushed me off by saying, and you've got lips for Holly, and he moved on to the next person. But uh, then you go into the Bob Barker studio and you marvel at how small everything is compared to how it looks on TV. <laughs> Backstage, you can feel it. The anticipation is at near frenzy. And they would just jump right into the show, kind of like no warning at all. Just here we go. We're getting ready. Boom. A new swimming pool. Being my first taping, I didn't want to be overly boisterous, so I waited for a few other people to yell out bids, and then I yelled out $14.99. $1,499. And if you look way in the back where Dee is sitting next to me, her head kind of snaps over to me like, She's surprised that I got that on the nose, even though she spent the whole time on the road quizzing me on prices. We had people shouting out the exact price. Of course, nobody knew that person knew the exact price, you know. So we allowed that. We were fine with that. Strongly clear enamel finish has two storage drawers, but it's 34 inches by 20 inches. A perfect So then on the, uh, the second item up for bids was a brass trunk, which I knew was... <laughs> which you can hear on the tape. $795. Deborah, you win. My first two bids in the studio were right on. The, the two things we did not let them do, we didn't allow them to take lists into the studio. In line, when they're waiting to come into the studio, we didn't allow them to say anything in the order of, everybody pay attention to me. I memorize all the prices, so everybody listen to me when I shout on a price, we'll all shout. We didn't allow that either. From about 1984 to 1989, I went to the show about once a year. It was always hard to try to find somebody to go with me, and we realized, I don't need anyone to go with me, I can go by myself. And there is the six down there in the piggy bank. Now I'll give you another number. Well, first of all, we were very, very, absolutely, 100% proud of this. We would tape a 60-minute show in 60 minutes. Mark Breslau, our first director, and I'd say, well, how did the show win? Mark, and he'd say, no editing tonight. We had just completed a 60-minute show. And one of the reasons why Bob did, and he said, Roger, when you do the show to time, you become the editor. And I would go um, to the show whenever I had time off from school and was a first, second year teacher at the time. So summer school was not just an option. It was kind of a have to do this to make ends meet. In the summer of 1990, July 4th fell on a Wednesday and Price is Right used to tape on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. And so I called the show or called CBS. Uh, no, we're not taping on the 4th. We're taping on the 1st, 2nd and 3rd and hung up. I better call back and make sure. So I called back and I said, are you taping on Sunday, July 1st? And they said, yes, we are. And I said, great. So I went down and got my hotel and got my tickets and got in line the next morning and got into the studio. I had fairly good seats. I think I'm in the fifth row. I've now gotten a little frustrated that people aren't listening to my bidding and yelling and helping. As soon as the first item up for bids was described, as soon as Rod finished the description, I yelled out. Now there's the first, the first bid of the price is right, and everyone starts laughing. And he proceeds to tell them now, one of you, whoever gets the closest to the re actual retail price, will win that. And you, sir, have no chance of winning it. And they put the camera on me at that point, and I'm laughing, thinking, oh, you should not have said that. <laughs> and you can't see it on the film, because they changed the shot to the contestants, but his eyebrows went from about here Stand up out there. to about here. What is your name? Theodore, the actual retail price is twelve fifty. And it's fun when somebody would know the exact price. The whole audience would scream, yay, you know the exact price. And then Bob would turn to the audience and say, you see? Watch every day, and you can become a good shopper, just Listen, like John here. That Theodore is a bidder, isn't he? I, I own one. The show went to commercial, and usually what would happen was they would reintroduce Bob, and Bob would talk to the audience and say, thank you so much for coming, and, you know, does anyone have any questions, and blah, blah, blah. That day, he pretty much came down, and he said, Theodore, you watch The Price is Right, and he just kind of interacted with me. Sometimes the first game runs really short. Maybe it's scheduled to go six minutes, and it only goes three minutes because the person loses right away or wins right away. 
So this gives Bob two extra minutes. The stage manager told him, you know, we got 15 seconds or whatever, and he goes, oh, is it time to smile? And everyone would laugh. And Susan, who was a contestant in Contestants Row, turned around and she mouthed the words, help me. Well, Bob happened to notice like the very last part of this interaction about two seconds before they went back on the air. Susan was just overtly flirting with Theodore out here. And I thought, wow, that was pretty good that he caught that that quickly and turned it into something on the show. I mean, that kind of really showed what a good host he was. Um, so of course, now I've got someone listening to me and they bring out an item I've never seen before in my life. A lovely area rug. The models are, you know, getting it. Well, Rod's describing it. And I'm looking at Susan and I'm like, I don't know go for a thousand and she ended up bidding 1450 or something she went way over what i had said is that your bid or did you get that from theodore and bob reads the price and it was a thousand fifty nine and that kind of surprised me that i was that close they call down the next person and they bring out the item and i can tell kind of immediately it's these little emmett kelly figurines and one of the other contestants actually turned around and looked at me and i was like oh i can't give her the right bid because i kind of promised susan i'd help her so susan finally turned around and i told her you know, six ninety-five. I used to be much better at that. Six ninety-five, um, Susan. So six ninety-five, and Susan's going up on stage. And he says, "Well, I have to ask her, don't I?" Theodore, give you yes, that. Yes, he did. Theodore. <laughs> Will dinner tonight be separate checks? I'll pay. <laughs> there you are, Theodore. Whether you get on stage or not, Theodore, you've won a little prize on the prices, right? Um, meanwhile, they've opened the doors on the prize that she's going to play for in the check game, and it's a big screen TV. And back in those days, they would usually have the contestant's reaction on the TV so you could kind of see the prize and the reaction at the same time. Well, that day, because of what was going on, they instead had me on the big screen TV. Screen TV! Uh, when Rod described it, I knew the TV was the $3,900 TV. And so I knew in order for her to get to 6,000, which is the most you can win, that she needed to write the check for 2,100. And Susan, you know how to play this game, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? I was trying to tell her 2,100. You can actually see me at one point kind of finishing off the 2,100 and then doing it again. She's writing the check for 3,000. Started yelling, no, 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 no. And she just kept going and she wrote it for 3,000. And so. 6,900. Maybe Theodore will leave the tip. I'm just like, nope, nope, not going to do it. You know, Bob walked back down to the kind of the front of the stage and he goes, well, Theodore, what happened there? And I didn't even have to say a word. I had 300 people jump to my defense at the same time and so loud that he was looking around. He's like, what, 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 what? And he actually gave, he redeemed me when they went back on uh, during the showcase showdown and he had Susan spin the wheel and he said, I was talking with the audience during that commercial and... Didn't you hear Theodore? No, I didn't hear He that. told you to, to write the check for $2,100. You would have had exactly $6,000. So, uh, oh, and by the way, I'm still waiting for that dinner. It's been, uh, what are we on, uh, 25, 27 years? A ceiling fan light! They so had several from that same manufacturer, but they were all... 500 and then, on the second part of the show, Bob kind of stopped, you know, referring to me on the air. And I thought, okay, that's fine, you know, whatever. A new car! The car that they had on that day was the exact same car I had seen a couple tapings prior. And it was very memorable because the contestant played Lucky 7, and he got the first three numbers on the nose, which never happens. And it was a $7,659 car. Pens and face cards are $1,000. The other cards are the number on the card in hundreds of dollars. <laughs> Aces are wild. Theodore is still out there, isn't he? Yeah. He asked me, you know, what is the price again? And I told him, and he goes, all right, you can take that for what it's worth, the contestant. She had to be within $800 of the price. $400, please. We're all like, stop, 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 stop. And she goes, one more. Okay. And she pulls another card, and it was an ace. And I'm like... Well, this will be awesome. She can get it right on the nose. So we're, I'm like, 459 459 I'll make that $500. $500. $7,700 is her bid. And we're all like, what are you doing? So we're thinking, okay, she's going to be over. 8694 A difference of $994. And I might add, Theodore, nobody is perfect. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lisa. We will have the second showcase showdown. The they went to commercial, and the producer came over and spoke to Bob for a second, and he said, well, Theodore, Roger just told me something interesting. He said we do have a model of that car that's $7,659, but we put different options on them to fool people like you. Basically, what I learned from that was I'm going to have to start listening carefully to what options they have on the different cars and kind of price that out. And as years went by with the internet, that actually became really easy because you could go on a manufacturer's website and find the options and see what they were worth. So it really made it much easier. By the time I was walking out to where my truck was, people were already leaving. And it was hilarious to me because everyone was like rolling down their windows and going, bye Theodore, good luck Theodore. I hope you get on the show Theodore, bye Theodore. It was just like I was this celebrity and it was just the most awesome feeling. I live right here in Hollywood. They have tour buses all the time. You can, I can't go out the door. There's not one going by, it seems. And I think a lot of the guys just, I, you know, go out completely. But I talk with them. <laughs> I stand out there and talk with them. And someone asked me, they said, why do you do that? Why, why? I said, listen, without those people, I would have had to work for a living. <laughs> That's the least I can do. <laughs> so in uh, early 91, my partner and I went down to the show. It was his first time going to The Price is Right. And we got in line early in the morning and a young African-American woman sat, I think she was behind us in line. Her family was supposed to come with her and they all kind of bailed on her. And so we kind of made friends with her during the course of the day. And she thought I was going to get picked and I thought my partner was going to get picked and he thought she was going to get picked. Lauren Reynolds is the last name they call and she screamed probably a good five seconds and jumped up. Like, oh my God, this is so cool. Somebody I've been talking to all day has gotten picked. Lauren, what do you say? $13.99. She played the game Bump for two prizes and uh, they don't even play that game anymore. But back then it was like there were four cars and you either had to bump the cars this way or bump the cars that way to represent the prices of the two prizes. They say that way! It is Lauren a winner! You are! So she wins. She's very excited. Uh, next Girl, contestant... Uh, 1049 Another perfect fit! I'm telling you, we're not fooling around today! I was one of the lucky teachers who had a off period at the end of the day and one day I was in my classroom working and this kid popped their head in and they're like we're doing a survey for the newspaper who would you want for your valentine if you could have anyone you wanted and I'm just like I don't know and I just went Holly from the Price is Right. Here comes the lovely Holly with the lovely prize. And so it actually made it into the school newspaper and I clipped the article and brought it with me. Oh and it is lovely. It the is tea set I knew was $1,250. Holly actually brought that out from the wings right over kind of where we were sitting. Well, this might be the perfect time. I could just give it to her while she's walking back up with the tea set. Well, apparently the gold-plated tea set's really heavy. So when she was pulling it back from contestants row and walking it, she had this look on her face like, I'm going to drop this thing. But I didn't want to be this weird stalker guy going, here, and, you know, throw this thing at her. 55 cents total. And I thought, well, there's no way she's going to the showcase with 55 cents. And... The second person ended up, I think, only with 40 cents, and the third person, I think, ended up with even less than that, and we were just shocked that she was, you know, going to the showcase. Ended up giving her a bit of 9,500. They went ahead and showed the second showcase. It was another one where I thought, okay, I know most of these, and generally how much it's gonna be, and when he bid, I was like, uh-oh, this might be really close. $1,814. And I thought, okay, well, she's closer than that. Lauren? or she's over, but I don't know which. 9,846, you win. The difference is $346. I can't believe it, this is the best show in the world. Oh, it's it better with every prize it's you Theodore. win. There's Theodore, there's Theodore, which, you know, because I helped her. So um, she comes down off the turntable and we give her hugs. At that point, the models had started coming out from backstage to, you know, walk us over to the prizes. And Holly had walked right up to me and just said, hey, or hi, or whatever. And I was like, oh, hey, 
And I proceeded to tell her very quickly the story about the article in the school newspaper. And she was like, that's so great. And she kind of gave me a kind of a hug. And we started walking over to the prizes, walking over to the bedroom. And she had kind of pushed me forward because I wasn't in the shot. And we we're like waving goodbye. And the show went off the air. Holly's just chatting with me like we're old buddies. It was just kind of a really neat moment. And uh, well, I, I said to a contestant one day who was very complimentary and had watched the show for years, I said, you're a loyal friend and true. And it kind of got a reaction. And uh, I started saying it, say, if they were a loyal friend and true, I, that was, as you said, knife like knighting. The most extreme LFAT. They watch every day, learn what our prices are. They're one. I changed the fonts one time. They were discussing that. And some people liked it and some people didn't. Whether they liked it or didn't, they were still loyal friends and true. Because they were discussing the font. Having been to two tapings and having been, you know, there's, there was always a sense of disappointment at the end of the show. Even though it was fun to be there and fun to watch people win, there was always that feeling of, well, they didn't pick me again and I've been here, you know, X number of times. So been to the Monday show, been to the Tuesday show, gonna stay for the Wednesday show. I brought the Holly shirt that I wore to the first taping, had the shirt on, and a lot of people were like, oh, he's got, oh, they were all kind of intrigued by it. This is the famous I'm Here to Kiss Holly shirt. And here's the back of the I'm Here to Kiss Holly shirt. I figured, okay, I better probably say something about it this time, because that other time, you know, producer just kind of looked at it and said, you've got lips for Holly. I figured, eh, maybe I'll, you know, think of something, so. Some of them, they weren't picked because their time wasn't right yet. We're standing there and we're ready and he's talking to the people on my right and he gets to me and he goes, Theodore, good to see you again. And I said, thank you. You know, we try to find exciting connections with people that people can warm up to. I said, I'm still a middle school math teacher and I'm still on my longest vacation ever, which is what I had said the two days before. But what happens is they get something that's more and more hungry. 30, 40, ah. Forget the refrigerator, forget the new car. This is why I'm here. And I pointed to my shirt and he looked at it and started laughing. And I, it kind of made me stop in the middle of what I was saying because I thought he's never laughed before. This is really different. Well, maybe they become ripe. And then we picked them. You usually couldn't hear names during the first four because it's so loud in there and they have cue cards because of that. But I could hear my first and last name pretty clearly. <laughs> In fact, so badly that the lady next to me, I think I put my hand on her bare leg because I was like, oh my God, they're calling my name. You know, most people would want to bid last. I wanted to bid first. So I ran kind of to the other end. On TV, looks like it's, you know, pretty far distance. It really isn't. It's about, you know, six or seven steps. And then what I remember is it seemed like an eternity while they called the other three people. And Probably doesn't help that I would have dreams about going to the show and getting picked and there'd be some stop down and it would take forever and they would never get around to finishing the show and I'd you know, end up with waking up from the dream and never having won anything. So I'm down there and I'm just like, what do I do, what do I do? And next thing I know the doors are opening and Bob's walking out and it was interesting because he walked a couple steps out and then he looked right at me. And Theodore, you made it, you made it. I was, you know, very excited at that point. And Theodore has been a loyal friend and true. How many times have you been here? 24. 24 times. And that really kind of surprised, I think, a lot of people because probably 95 to 99 percent of the audience is it's their first time. In fact, that's part of Rod's warm up is, ooh, look at that, an audience full of virgins. Um, and at last, you're in contestant row. I'm here to kiss Holly. Sorry, Bob. And everyone's laughing, and he goes, Theodore. Yours is one kiss I'll pass on, if you okay. don't mind. I, I knew from the moment we made the shirt, if 
he got, got to see it, he would make some kind of funny remark, and he did. Didn't disappoint me. Lovely outdoor furniture. Made by Malin, and at the time I knew I had three of those in my kind of database. I wasn't sure which one this was. Theodore, what do you say? $1,414. Josephine, who was the second contestant, bid $1,417. So I thought, well, if I'm not exactly right, I probably don't, I'm not going to win this. Fifteen seventy-eight. The winner is up. He ended up playing the check game for a trip to Mexico, which, good thing I did get up there. His trips were, you know, always kind of a guess. He wins his game, they go to commercial, and it's time to start up again, and the next item up for bids, and it's a recliner. So I listen carefully, and I look at the monitor, and I see it's a percline. Wardell, who's just come down to contestants row, bids first, and I'm thinking, please don't bid $5.99, please don't bid $5.99, please don't bid $5.99. Uh, $650. $650, and now let's go up here to Theodore. $5.99. $5.99. One of you is exactly right. $100 bonus for the contestant who bid $5.99. Theodore. Very happy. I go up on stage. I almost tripped going up the stairs. People say you don't really understand it until you're on the stage, and it's true. You get up there, and you're just kind of like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. It's very exciting. And I just uh... So Bob says to me now, in your 24 visits to the show, you've seen that recliner before, haven't you? And I said, I think so. I was trying to be modest, and he goes, You know so. I know so. You know so. Everyone starts laughing. And then he says, now, Mr. Roddy has good news for you. Now you have a chance to win up to 10000 the, uh, the stagehand would always have a cue card with the next pricing game that they were going to play, so Bob would kind of know where he needed to go. I mean, with 50, 60, 70 games, you got to kind of know, where am I going next? Um, and I had seen that this game had started with a P, and it looked like a U, and I thought, well, punch board's for money. Money's always good, you know, you don't... So he pulls me back and proceeds to start to explain, you know, what we're going to do, and meanwhile, the third door opens, and the prizes that I'm going to price are behind there, and Holly's going to show the prices of those, and she sees my shirt. As you well know, you can win four punches on the punch board. And starts, she kind of burst out laughing, and Bob says, Come on, Holly, give him a kiss, so he can concentrate on what he's doing. Come on, Holly, give him his kiss, and so she comes walking out, and he pushed me over, and we kind of met in the middle. And just seen his shirt. There it is. I thought we were done, and she kind of grabbed my face and just planted one right on my lips. That's enough, Theodore. That's enough. That's enough. I have to say that if you've ever seen him kind of guide contestants by grabbing them by the elbow, and he wasn't gentle about it with me. That's what I remember was it was kind of like, ooh, he's doing this with a purpose. He goes, that's enough, Theodore, that's enough. I've got a show to do. And he's grabbing my arm and pulling me back. And Holly's laughing and going back to where she is. And I don't want an engagement. It's just a kiss. And uh, Holly, meanwhile, is motioning me to, like, wipe my lip because I guess she got something on me. So I'm trying to do that, not on camera. And it didn't come out very well because you can still see me do it. Right price, high or low? Lower. Lower, Holly. That's right. It was $160. I mean, this thing is this big, and you think, how can there be $160 worth of stuff in that? But anyway, um, I got that one right. Second one was, I think, the children's clothing. Higher. Right And I got that one right. And then there was a dumbbell set. Yes, yes, yes. Hamilton Beach photo laminator. I say, that one's $50. I know that one for sure. You got them all. So I won all four punches, and... Now I have to figure out where I'm gonna punch. And on my home game that I had programmed, I had just played punch a bunch like that week and had just done like the middle four holes on the board. And the very first one was 10,000. And I thought, well, maybe something like that would work. So I just kind of went on the second row and just did every other hole that I could For do. the first contestant who ever did that. Theodore, you have done quite well. And I thought, oh no. Honestly can say, if, it, if he had shown me $10,000 on that, I probably would have passed out right there. $1,000! He turns it around and it's $1,000, and I think, okay, $1,000 is nice. There's only five on there that are bigger than that. 44 are smaller than that. My luck is usually, if I give this back, I'm gonna regret it. 
And the audience, of course, there's 300 people telling me, give it back and go, give it back. And I'm just like, he's taking the $1,000. There you are. He's taking the $1,000 and he hands it to me. And the audience is like, boo, boo, boo. And you can see me turn to them and say, you don't have $1,000 to lose. I don't blame him. He could have had $500. And I'm looking at the audience like, see? And he goes, or he might have gone on and ended up with $250. And I'm thinking, yep, this is about right. It's down, down, down. And he goes to the last hole and he says, or in the last hole, he would have had to accept 50 bucks. You did the right thing, Theodore. Congratulations. Walked over to where the producer was because, you know, you watch the show that long, you know exactly what you're supposed to do when it's time to go. And... Lights went down, and Roger started to kind of escort me down the stairs to show me where I was supposed to sit. And I was about two steps down, and I said, oh. And I stopped, and I reached in my pocket, and I got the $100 bill, and I handed it to him. And he stopped and looked at me. He literally grabbed my arm and said, thank you. Because I had been there enough times with Perfect Bids to see that he would always ask the contestant when they were going back down, I need the $100 bill back. They'd give it to him. He'd give it back to Bob. So, you know because you can't leave there with their money. Spin that wheel, and I don't have to tell you to get it all the way around. And I should also mention that I thought this was kind of neat. They changed out the little circular carpets that the contestants stood on, on that taping. So I was literally the first person to stand on both of them. First spin, 40 cents. Spun the wheel the first time, got 40 cents, and spun it again, thinking, you know, well, I can't stand on 40 cents, I'm probably going to get beat 40 cents and 15 hurry that's fine uh, second time I landed on 15 so I'm like well, at least I'm still in the game Lauren went to the showcase with 55 cents maybe I can do it too so I go over and stand under the scoreboard Thomas spins the first time and you will spin again he didn't beat me so he's spinning again and, uh, 40 cents you're the leader with 70 cents But unfortunately, on his second spin, he got 70 cents total. So I'm out. So I went over where I'm supposed to go. And as I'm waiting for the showcase showdown to finish, it dawns on me, hmm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm going back and sitting in the audience, and I'm not in the showcase, and my time on The Price is Right is over. So, okay. And they kind of line everybody up, the three people who didn't get on stage, the six people who did, and you all go up the aisle, and there's a little curtain that they take you through, and there's an area where you sit, and they process you with your paperwork. I'm looking down at my paperwork, and all of a sudden, there's like this tap on my shoulder, and someone's saying hi to me. I look up, and it's Holly, and she's handing me an autographed picture, and I'm like... Hey, and I got up and I gave her a hug and she said, I just, you know, wanted to bring this to you. And I was like, thank you so much. And she left. And to me, that was always like the best moment of the whole experience because she was always my favorite model. To me, it was like, I didn't ask for an autograph picture, but she felt like, you know, I was such a great fan that, you know, it'd be a nice thing to give me. And I was just, it was really kind of, kind of blown away by the whole thing. And uh, we finished up our paperwork and they kind of sent us on our way. And then I sat home and waited for my prizes to come. And the rest, as they say, is history. I have a copy of the prize form. This lists everything that I won on the show. You notice there's two different money amounts. The 100 for my perfect bid and the 1,000 for playing Punch a Bunch. This is what I got from Berkline so that I can choose the color of my recliner. I think I chose that top right-hand color. And here's the directions for the dumbbell set that I won. And I still have the photo laminator, including the pouches to laminate and the directions. So in, I think it was um, 2002, the Memorial Day time frame, um, I got together a kind of a ragtag group. It was uh, my partner, a friend of ours, her mom, my nephew, my sister, my dad, another nephew, and me. That's eight. That's all of us. So we all showed up in line. A little short time later, uh, a couple of guys got in line behind us, and 
We soon started chatting with them a little bit and their names, uh, one of them was named Brandon. I don't remember his brother's name. Um, Brandon was a bundle of energy at three in the morning. Um, just incredibly excited and hyper to be there. And we spent the day kind of chatting with him and his brother a little bit. And my dad and my sister, bless their hearts, and I don't mean this ugly, they had this way of pimping me out to the other contestants. Well, you know, if you get picked, my brother or my son knows a lot of the prices and you should listen to him. And then it's like, great, now you put pressure on me to perform. Thank you very much. Um, you know what I like about The Price of Right? It's, it's, it's a very democratic show. Not democratic in the sense of political parties. Because we pick from the audience, gives everybody a chance to win. He said, I'm going to get picked as a contestant. I'm going to win a car. I'm going to spend a dollar on the wheel and I'm going to win the showcase. And we were all like, okay, well, that's positive thinking. Good for you. Well, he, he studies prices. You should listen to him. And Brandon must have asked me at least three times during the day, how much are the Flintstone vitamins? And every time I would be 672, remember? That's what they were the last time you asked me, Brandon. And here comes Brandon just like coming down the aisle. People are trying to high five him and he realizes, oh, I'm supposed to high five people. So he kind of went back and then high fived a few more people and went on down to contestants row. There's four people. And who gets to go up in the stage? It's the one that does the best job. Well, I don't know what happened to him, but I think his mind kind of blanked for a while because first item up for bids came and went. Second item up for bids, third item up for bids, fourth item up for bids. <laughs> We're running out of chances. During the commercial, I think they had just stood up. Bob would always make a joke about, you guys can stand up and make another bad bid and sit down again. They had just stood up and Brandon turned around to look at his brother and I just was like, I looked at him and I like kind of waved and he just went. Before they come to him, you can see him mouthing the like he's ready to say it. And everyone's bidding like 600 and 800 and these you know, nice round numbers and they get to Brandon and he goes, 1554. 1554. People in the audience going, just making these faces and shaking their head and going, oh, like this. And they light up his bid and the perfect bid bell goes 1554. off. 1554. And Bob is like, well, we have to know the story of this bid. Have you seen that barbecue before? And he says, no, I just took a bid from the audience. And Bob said, and sir, here's your, <laughs> and Brandon likes grabbing the money and everyone's laughing. Cause it's like, you know, I would never do that. A new car. And then they get on stage and they play against the house. They're not playing against Bob. Bob's on their side. Which is, which is kind of unusual in game show. Oh, I got it. <laughs> he's out of control. So he's already gotten on the show and he's already, already won his car. He goes up to spin the wheel and what does he land on? I loved our show because you're always rooting for the contestant. Bob is rooting for the contestant. Brandon Showcase had a pool table which I knew was about, I think it was $2,100. It had a computer, which I knew was yeah, probably around $1,500. I don't know that I knew it exactly. And it ended with another car. And I kind of knew roughly the price, but I'm like, I don't want to make him go over, so I'm going to under, you know, lowball this. And I decided on $20,000 for the whole thing. $22,018. You win with the difference of only two. We thought we were going to be able to go up on stage and celebrate with him, but... Roger stopped us at the stairs <laughs> and his brother came down and he let him go up on stage. After the show, he gave me the biggest hug I've probably ever gotten in my life. He was still so excited. He's like, I wanna keep in touch with you. Can I have like your phone number? And I said, well, I can give you my email address. And he said, I don't have a computer. And I said, Brandon, you just want a computer. And he goes, oh my God, I just want a computer. And I'm like, yeah, but you just want two cars. <laughs> Almost every show I've been to, they had um, VIPs. And on this particular taping, my dad, my sister, and my nephew were with me. And we had, must have gotten in line very early because we ended up in the second row, as I recall. I ended up sitting right next to a woman whose name is Pam. And they actually came in, of course, right before the show. Bob, you know, talked to the audience for a second and he said, well, Pam, it's nice to see you. And she said, hi, Bob. And they were talking back and forth. And, I was like, well, wow, this is interesting. And I, I asked her when, about 
when they went back into the taping, she said she was Marcus and secretary. Right. Sarah? That's right. Again, we have just tied the all time record for perfect dead. We've had three. Bob announces retirement. I remember the exact date. It was October the 30th, 2006. He phones me up in the office. Everything's going fine in the office. He says, Roger, I think I'm retiring. This is my last year. <laughs> One more than $140,000. Now, folks, I want to thank you very, very much for inviting me into your home for the last 50 years. I am deeply grateful. And please remember, help control the pet population. Have your pets spayed or neutered. Goodbye, everybody. In 2007, as you probably know, Bob Barker retired from The Price is Right after his 35th year. I said, Bob, you can't retire. He said, no, I, I think it's time. It's 35 years, 50 years in the show business and 35 years in the show. It's a good time. And it really was 50 years in the show business, 35 years in the show. I consider myself a very lucky man because all my life I did something I thoroughly enjoyed. I really did. I never got up in the morning and thought, oh, I don't want to go in there today. Never. I really enjoyed it. And upon retiring, I really miss it. But I, you have to keep a stiff upper lip and accept it. I, I really have sympathy for someone who doesn't have uh, the same feeling. The feel, I don't want to go to work feeling. I, it, that would be terrible. And we're taking a picture. And this driving up to my space that I had. Into his very perfect This is front our Dobkowitz on. Right by the artist's entrance. <laughs> Roger's going to be his fan because, whoops, it's the second to the last taping of The Price is Right. These things happen in television. They change producers all the time. You have a hit show and all of a sudden they have new producers for the new season. That's what happened to me. I, I, I was spoiled by working 36 years on a show and uh, I was lucky to have worked 36 years on a, on a great, great show. Try to figure out how to open it. <laughs> Here, Roger, is what you missed most of all. And this is true. I, I got home and I said to Valerie, I didn't even get a character. <laughs> and you said the same thing to me. <laughs> When Drew was coming in as the host, I was going to ask him, would you please continue to say, have your pets spayed or neutered? And we came in and he said, how do you do, Drew? And he said, Bob, I want you to know, I'm going to keep right on the end of every show, have your pets spayed or neutered. I kissed him on the lips. Christmas time. 
so I continued to watch the show, track the prices in case, you know, friends or family wanted to go back to the show. And at the end of season 36, they made a decision to change the rules to the show, where if it had been 10 years or more since you'd been on the show, you were once again eligible. And before the rule had been, once you were on the show, you were not eligible again. So to me, this was like, well, this is cool. I can go back and maybe get on a second time. So I really put a lot of effort into studying the prices over the summer. So this is the program I wrote to help me memorize the prices on the show. I broke everything down by category. So go ahead and hit regular prizes. And here comes a mattress. I have the description that they read on the show, a picture of what it looks like on the show. And there are 1,073 prizes in this database. As I recall, this was maybe $25.99. I am correct. So if you notice, the left two guests went down by one. And when I was uh, going on the show in 2008, I was able to get through this entire file in an hour. Because I figured, well, now, you know, I can win something for myself again, maybe do better than last time. You know, who knows what's possible. Terry, bid $23,743. Actual retail price, $23,743. You got it right on the nose. You win five shell cases. Hasn't happened since 72 or 73. Right on the nose. You won 56000 Terry, you there? Yes, I am. Mr. Terry Neese, aren't you, a, a, should I say lucky? <laughs> well, or should I say talented? Or should I say, what should I say? Well, I, I don't know, quite frankly. I, I kind of feel like I'm in the middle of a storm. But yeah, yeah, I think I'm very lucky. This Terry Nice fucks changed things up a little bit, too. Oh, that dude. That dude uh, who he bid... Got it, he got the exact amount. To the penny. Right. On both showcases? Uh, yeah, he won both showcases because he got his showcase on the... Right to the dollar. Right. Yeah. And somebody on a headset's got to be freaking out. Well, we all thought something happened. Right. Has anyone talked to you about that or brought that up to you? When we were outside in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning, we were the first three people in line. There was a fellow that had been there like 99 times. Wow. Some people kind of make a career out of this. <laughs> the guy next to me had been there 33 times. There was an older couple named Norbert and Francis. Terry, who's the man next to me with the silver hair, gets on his phone and he's talking to his wife. You probably should come over and get in line. It's starting to get really busy. And he says goodbye and he hangs up. And I said, okay, I said, I don't want to be rude. My sister would kill me if I didn't tell you this. I said, this is not the greatest neighborhood in the world. I'm happy to hold your place in line, you know, no problems. And he goes, oh, are you sure? I said, yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, they were back in probably five minutes. His wife's name was Linda, very nice lady. Obviously a big fan of the show. And we play pricing games. You know, what are the cookies worth? And what's the salsa sauce going for? And what about Esther C? These are... <laughs> uh, at this point, it's a different producer who's now making the selections. And he starts asking us our questions. And I had prepared. I thought, okay, I got to really catch his interest. You know, tell me about yourself. And I said, I'm a mathematics assessment specialist for an educational testing company. And he just like reacted like I had just, you know, shot him with a machine gun. And I think he may have asked me, you know, what does that mean or, you know, whatever. And, you know, I thought, well, that's good. At least he asked me more than one question and things are good. And the third name is Terry Neese. And like I am in that studio, I'm like, Terry, I remember there was a Terry in line somewhere. Where was that Terry? And Terry jumps up two seats away from me. I'm like, oh, Terry, this guy right here. And he runs, of course, he steps into contestants' row because he's right behind it, pretty much. Wind plus water equals the perfect day on this new sailboat. I think it was thirty-five ninety-five, but it had recently gone up, and I didn't know that yet. Enjoy hours of fun as you sail your favorite waterway on this 10-foot boat. And I think you can see me either signaling or saying, you know, thirty-five ninety-five, and he reads the price, it's $36.95, and the guy who was closest goes up on stage, and Terry wasn't listening to me, and Linda didn't, I guess, know yet that I knew my prices, so. There was a guy from the, this fan group that was able to, which showed up, and he was in the front row or the second row, and uh, he was giving people advice, like people do from the audience. Well, the first item up for bid that I successfully bid on was the large green egg ceramic cooker. And the first time it was $900, which it had been previously to that. And then in March, 
it was on the show again, but it was 11.75. And it was on about three weeks before, oh. and I knew the price was 11.75 on that. Oh. And Terry looked to Linda and me for advice, and so we signaled him or told him 11.75. So that got me up on the stage, and. We went on from there. We encourage them to yell out what they think the price is. They're always yelling. Yeah, one guy won a Chevy one time on the show. He was with a friend of his that was a Chevy salesman. Oh, geez. And got every number just, and uh, so what? Yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes. $44. $44. She realized that I knew some of the prices that I was yelling out and things were correct. And she kind of was like, I'm going to listen to you. I was like, okay. So she gets back up. And she bid 2201. She bid one dollar higher than whoever was the highest. And Drew reads the price, and it's 2598. And you can see her kind of look at me like, "Whoa!" Ah! And they open the doors, and she's going to play for a car. And I'm trying to listen carefully to the car and the options. And I remember it was a Pontiac Vibe. So I'm thinking, okay, 17,695. And then I hear this endless string of options that's going on and on and on and on that I can't even possibly keep up with it. And then I heard AM FM stereo and paint and fabric protectant. And uh, some lady was paying one away and got every single number exactly and was like looking at this guy and changing the number because this guy was yelling out, no, that's five, seven, <laughs> you know, oh, I make that a seven, you know. Well, the way they had the number set up, I could tell what the price, it, it had to be 18546 because I usually don't repeat digits. And I knew it had to end with a six because only the paint and fabric protectant caused that last digit to change. But when that guy that that ended up in the showcase, when he was doing his pricing game, it was in door two, and we were really far away from that guy. Oh, yeah. We couldn't hear him. Good. And he lost his pricing game. They go to commercial, they come back to do the wheel. Terry spins first, because I think he won the least, and he hit 90 cents. And we were just like, this is awesome, he's got a good chance. And the other two contestants spun, they didn't beat him, so we're like, this is great, he's in the showcase, yay, we're happy. You know, we can see Terry, he's just like right up here, probably, you know, stone's throw away. And the showcase, what was your strategy? The karaoke machine had been used as a get up on the stage prize before. And it was $1,000, and the way I remembered it was, that big giant tower was the one and then there were zeros after it in my head, and that's just the way I thought of that. Then they opened another door. You know, it's three things everybody's seen before. Certainly the guy from the, this uh, Rain Man dude from the, <laughs> from the fan group. Yep, that's the $2,800 pool table. I knew they were about 3000 That put me at $4,000. And the last prize is the high-low trailer. The rule of thumb for campers is $1,000 a foot. Well, there's two of them. There's a 17-foot and there's a 22-foot. I thought he said 19 feet. So I'm thinking $19,000. You're amazing, okay. It looks kind of short, but I listened to make sure that was what it was. I added it up, I told Linda what it was, and I said, let me do it again. And I added it up again in my head, and I said, 23,743, is that what I said before? And she said, yes. Meanwhile, she's passing it on to Terry. She decides to pass, Terry looks at us, and then I thought, Maybe we don't want to call this much attention to ourselves. <laughs> Maybe we should just get both showcases and not make it a big spectacle. So I went 23500 but I think at that point he was really focusing on Linda, and I'd already told her the price. And you can see him kind of mouthing numbers and looking at us, and he says, 23743 Wow. And Drew, most ironic statement ever, says, that's a very exact bid. And, uh, so I know I'm in the ballpark. Now, as strange as this sounds, I opened my mouth and the 743 came up. <laughs> then he proceeds to show Sharon her showcase, which is every trip in the house that I had no idea because like I said, trips were always a big guess and it depends if you're going from one place to another or if you're always starting from LA and who knows. So she bid 30,525 and we're all like, okay, great. But the second Terry made that bid, I saw Kathy Greco, who is now one of the producers. She's got a clipboard. She's just standing there watching, and she just turned and walked over to this little area that was called the puppet booth. It was where the kind of the production people sat behind this screened wall, and she just stood there and stared into that okay, screen. She is. We'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. They go to commercial, and everything stopped. <laughs> Kathy Greco, but she came out with her headphones. She was like, like that. And I was like, what happened? She goes, 
He had a clipboard. He got the exact amount. And I go, I went like, what? And what was the item? I feel, there was like, there's always like three, four things. I don't know. And I go, I go, that ever happened before? And she goes, no. That had never happened before. No, so that's what she said right away. People on the show were on the stage talking with other people on the show. We shut down for like 10 minutes. Right. 15 minutes, which is a long time. They started playing the music again to keep the audience up and we're clapping along. And I think the song may have been like, We Built This City by Jefferson Starship. And everybody was like, that standards and practice there. What are we going to do? What does this mean? What does this mean? Yeah, does this have, is this possible? Right. You know, could this even happen? And we're clapping along and I'm looking around and I glance up and I'm like, there's a camera staring right at me, just right in front of me on the stage. Did the someone cheat? That's got to come. Yeah, and this fan group had a lot. Of, we knew that this guy was yelling out prices because we knew the people that were in the fan group. That question has popped up, you know. Oh, he cheated. Did you cheat? <laughs> I don't know how you could cheat. First off, I have a little bit of a hearing problem. Okay. So if people were yelling prices, I couldn't hear it very well. But, hmm, well, they obviously know it came from me, you know. We'll, we'll see how this plays out. And Let's give the guy's prize right now. We'll investigate it. And so when we come back on the air and you're not thrilled for the guy, which is all, all well, the I fucking think press I'm, talking I think about. I'm fucking, I think I'm fucked. Right. You're out of a job. I think I'm out of a job. You think they're shutting down the show? I think, I'm, I think they're shutting down the show. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Sharon. But finally, they <laughs> bring the lights back up and Drew and the contestants are in place. And this is probably the saddest moment. She only missed her showcase by $494, which with that much money involved was a pretty darn good bid. He walks over to Terry. And I thought they were never going to air it anyway. Right. So I was like, well, fuck it. <laughs> they said that before you went back on the air. And, and I didn't think they could. Right. Yeah, I remember hearing somebody wondering how they could even air it, right. you know, if there was a scandal. Right. You know, and I was like, well, this is fucked. You know, I mean, I was so depressed right then. Actual retail price, $23,743. You got a red display on the changed to just a zero. And then they showed his total. And... Linda went up on stage. He was Terry, I think, was more like shocked than anybody that he was on the nose. And Linda went up and gave him a hug, and they went and looked at the prizes. And oh, it was a standing ovation. I was stunned. You know, it's just like being dipped in Novocaine. It yeah. wasn't like forty-seven hundred. No, you know, it was ridiculous. Yeah, down it was to right the on the. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And so we, everybody thought that something happened. You know, we're all in the audience clapping, and we're all on our feet because it's such an exciting moment. And. I'm standing there smiling and clapping, and Le Kathy Greco's standing right in front of me on the stage, just shooting me the dirtiest look I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> and the, there was a producer on the show my first year that had been there 35 years. Right. There was, he'd been there his whole television career. It was his first job out of college. And uh, then he wasn't there my second year of the show. And this fan group, they didn't blame me for getting for him not being there, but we thought somebody from the staff had was also mad about this and was cooperating with the fan group and was like, just to fuck the show over, gave the guy the price of the showcase. Yeah, you and didn't have to be Oliver to Stone to see a conspiracy theory going down. Yeah. Show goes off the air, Linda comes back down, and next thing you know, Kathy's at the front of the stage and she's like, Linda, Linda. And she turns back around and she motions her back up on stage. And I thought, oh, here we go. Now they're going to call us all up there and find out what happened and ask us questions. And Like, they were always getting a lot of inside information about the show. And we never knew how they were getting their information mm -hmm. about things we were planning or things we were doing. They just had a lot of contacts, right. you know, in the show. Well, what happened was, I guess she had wanted Drew to autograph her shirt. And so they were going to have that done. And so they took her up and he autographed her shirt. And they were mad about this guy not being here. So we all thought, like, oh, they're just fucking with us now because they're mad. And now they're oh, trying to the hurt the show. Oh, the producer of the 35-year... Yeah, now they're mad because this guy's not here anymore. They're just trying to fuck with us. They were, there was discussion because they had fired Roger Dobkowitz, who was the producer from day one. And they thought that I was part of this fan group that was trying to take the show down. And Turns out? Turns out the guy was just... Was able to... Because we never... He beat the game? It, yeah, because we didn't repeat, because we repeated prizes so much, he was able to just like memorize all the major ones we give away. There were all these theories, none of which were correct. I mean, I think we've proven that I've known my prices from day one, and it's not unusual for me to help people win. Right. Now it's like constant meetings, constant prize pitching. You know, like that's never going to happen again. What are crackers worth, and what's the salsa sauce going for, and what about ester C? These are. <laughs> 
so in that sense, yeah, we were playing pricing games out on the street. So let's just say you did your homework. I did my homework. And that's what I'd suggest to anybody that's going to do that show. Do your homework. Watch the show. Watch the show. Watch the show. Did you hear that? Watch the show. And you I, honestly, all those guys are you want to come wait in line. They never had to wait in line before, so I'm not going to. But if you want to wait in line and, and come see the show and try your best, never going to be able to do that again. You know, I've been called a lot of ugly names on the Internet and in podcasts and things like that. And it's just sad that people don't know the whole story. So I appreciate being able to tell it. My dad would ask from time to time, well, did you ever hear from Brandon? Well, I just think he should have given you something for all that help. And I was like, dad, that's not why I help people. It's just, it's fun to watch people win. And you know, I don't have to pay their taxes. So, you know, good for them. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Don't be so serious. Life's too mysterious. You work, you save, you worry so. But you can't take it out when you go, go, go. So keep repeating, it's the berries. The strongest oak must fall. The sweet things in life to you were just loan. So how can you lose what you've never owned? Life is just a bowl of cherries. So live and laugh at it all.